I think uh, it's uh, ready. We are ready to, to start. Hello, everyone. My name is Liviu Kosheranu. I am a member of uh, Science Council of uh, uh, New Strategy Center. And uh, I have the honor uh, today to chair uh, this, uh, this uh, panel. Today in this panel, uh, we uh, try to discuss something about research and development uh, inside of uh, uh, defense activities. And uh, together uh, with uh, the five speakers, one of them is uh, via v uh, VTC, we try to, to find a, a good uh, solution uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this field. Uh, you know, every day we can identify the opportunities about uh, uh, research and development, but uh, it depends on us how we capitalize on them, uh, how we define the, the role on the place of research and development in society, how, how uh, we uh, understand the relationship between the re uh, research and development uh, and industry, between a national uh, and the European uh, capabilities uh, research and development. For uh, research and development, uh, for me, for my experience, these things, uh, uh, we, uh, he has uh, two things uh, are need. Resources, of course, of many and in materials, and the other one uh, is uh, patience. We can say resilience. Of course, uh, those are conditioned by the answer to the questions. Do you know what we want from research and development? I am convinced that during the presentation, uh, for, uh, my fellow speaker will uh, share this experience in this field. About research and development, Einstein in the, the, some books about the crisis say something uh, like that. The solution of the crisis can be done through, our, can be done uh, uh, in two, sol uh, two, two ways. One of them is uh, from uh, armed conflict, another of, uh, with uh, science uh, technologies. I think uh, this uh, idea, these ideas, uh, in these ideas we can uh, discuss today with my fellow uh, colleagues. And uh, after uh, the, his, pre his uh, presentation, uh, we have a uh, um, section for the question, and uh, I ask to, to think about that. So, uh, I think uh, it's time to start the panel. Uh, first speaker is a uh, major uh, general uh, PhD engineer Teodor uh, Incikas, Chief of General Directorate of, of Armaments. Um, major, uh, general Major uh, uh, Incikas is responsible in the Ministry of Defense for the management, for procurement, strategics, politics, and uh, un uh, unfolding uh, of the acquisition process and the related contract aims uh, and the one uh, of the armed forces. Um, prior to this appointment, in the time uh, 2017 and 2012, uh, General, uh, Major General Inchikash served as a deputy of, of, uh, for resources uh, on the Chief of, uh, of, of Defense. In this uh, experience, I think uh, General can say us uh, a lot of things about uh, what it means research and development and uh, how Ministry of Defense uh, understand this, uh, this concept. General, please. Thank you very much. Oh, it's working automatically. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, uh, organization, or organizing this conference. And uh, I want to express my appreciation for a new strategy center for this in, in day where they are doing yearly. And also thank you for inviting me here. While speaking about research and development is more complicated than it is in this title because we are speaking about both national and international efforts where we are part, where we are part of indeed. So how the title refers more to European research and development 
for defense, so uh, I will not jump into the national efforts because there are significance there in developing our own uh, R&D um, processes and, um, and uh, structures. So I will just refer to the, our efforts in, uh, in connection with, uh, our, uh, with the European Union efforts concerning the research and development. So in order to have a logic in this, I will read some of ideas uh, I put here. Um, facing emerging security challenges and an even more dynamic environment within the last years, the European Union has undertaken an irreversible process in order to develop its defense capabilities and strengthen the common security and defense policy as its member states should be prepared to react swiftly and seamlessly to any crisis wherever they are. Uh, the security and defense dimension of this reflection is in our view of great importance. The future of the European Union cannot be imagined without defining its global role and agreeing on the tools we want to provide for uh, our uh, Union. This is why we see initiatives within the European Union very important that therefore we are participating heartily in the, uh, these initiatives, um, such as program structured cooperation, PESCO, coordinated annual review of defense card or the European Defense Fund. I refer uh, more in this uh, short presentation. Um, since the launching of the Global Strategy in 2016, the European Union has embraced the process aimed at fulfilling the level of ambition in the field of security and defense. Actually, we consider that finally, from European, from European Union, we have a kind of level of ambition, including in this uh, uh, new sector like uh, 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 research and development. European U uh, Union defense initiatives are taken forward in a coordinating manner by using a single set of EU capability development priorities derived from the capability development plan, which is a key reference for the collaborative defense capability development in EU framework. Permanent structured cooperation PESCO is one of the key initiatives that leverages the whole effort dedicated to transform European defense. The difference between PESCO and other forms of cooperation is the binding of nature of the 20 commitments undertaken by participating <laughs> member states. Do you have a protest or something? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Romania remains attached to the commitments assumed when joining PESCO and uh, keen of making progresses in better integrating these initiatives, this initiative actually in the national defense planning system. The participation in PESCO project is equally important in order to bring closer uh, all particip participants and better integrate our efforts. As a concrete national contribution to PESCO, our country launched two projects under this framework. It's about European network of diving centers and CBRN defense training range. I refer to those who are leading uh, the process. We are confident that they will bring added value to the European uh, landscape in these areas. Also, we are participating in other 10 projects, so totally we are participating in 12 PESCO projects, which helps indeed us in consolidating our capabilities. The coordinating annual review on defense, or CART, should become a valuable tool in designing the course of action in the area of capability development cooperation, in particular as pathfinder for PESCO and EDF projects, supporting the implementation of the agreed EU capability development priorities. Romania remains committed to, de in to develop European capabilities in various formats at a different levels approach in all six CART focus areas. From our perspective, enhanced military mobility, soldier system, and counter US are important areas for capability development. Also, we see artificial intelligence, cyber defense, tactically multi planned piloted aerial systems, sorry, as key domination for do domains for cooperation. Re Romania connected to cards involved in six EDA. R&D projects and seven PESCO projects that could contribute to the implementation of CARD recommendations within the identified collaborative opportunities. So let's come now to European Defense uh, Fund after galloping through the others. EDF together with CARD and PESCO 
are looking for the best solution for harmonizing processes for military planning at EU level, providing the necessary support to member states in increasing the synchronization of national processes for endowing the armed forces and reducing fragmentation of the defense sector by strengthening the European defense technological industrial base. I would take my time to recall that the ADF's main objectives, namely, remains to foster competitiveness, efficiency, and innovation capacity of the European defense technological and industrial base, which contributes to the Union's strategic autonomy and its freedom of action by supporting collaborative actions and cross-border cooperation between legal entities throughout the Union, in particular, in particular to small and medium enterprises and mid-caps which means that in practice the EDF is to support both collaborative research and development of defense products and technologies, thus bringing the preparatory action of defense research and the European Defense Industrial Development Programs, EDIDP, as you know, pilot cases under a single umbrella. This will ensure the necessary continuity and uptake of technological research by industry and MODs, especially on those technologies and development actions which would not have been otherwise conducted by member states along. Uh, as an integrated part of the overall multi-annual multi multi financial framework, 2021-2027 package, the EDF is a particular EU program for a number of reasons. The EU is for the first time in its history allocating money from the Union's budget in order to supplement and amplify national investments in defense by supporting collaborative research and development. Um, the implementation of EDF requires an important attention in our normal day-to-day -day defense planning practices. This will take some time. Uh, for example, in order to harmonize functional uh, programs, we have to connect to a, a multitude of uh, focal points and to exchange experience with uh, participants from other states and permanently be in contact with uh, uh, EU planners, so it's uh, not so easy. To better support the implementation of EDF at national level, it is necessary to enhance the transparent dialogue and interaction among our military experts and the interested industrial research actors, in particular with innovative small and medium enterprises, including in order to attract non-traditional industrial entities into the defense sector. Um, in this regard, I would uh, like to mention that the European Commission is proposing the establishment of a network of national focal points. I believe our uh, invitee from Brussels will tell more about uh, having among the main functions to organize information and promotional activities. Um, of course, this we will, we will uh, plug in, and but this is the common effort, let's say, parallelly with the Ministry of National Defense took some other steps in encouraging the participation of Romanian entities into EDF. When I'm speaking about entities, I refer to, I, I'm referring to Romanian companies, to Romani Romanian uh, research institutes, and also to the Romanian universities or academia, let's say. Uh, the first step was to transparently explain what EDF is intending to be and the stage of its development. Therefore, we organized together with a new strategy center, thank you again, two conferences online with a large participation and, in, and with important briefers, we say. That was our first effort. Secondly, uh, we set a permanent in, uh, informational tool on the site of the General Directorate for Armament. We answered to all the questions we received from, uh, um, uh, from the economic entities and from uh, uh, research institutes. We try to be as open as we can because we want to see more and more Romanian entities involved in uh, the development of uh, EDF. Um, actually, in this um, direction, I have to underline that in the next period, we will promote together with the representative of the Ministry of uh, Economy and Entrepreneurship and, and uh, Tourism and the representative of the Ministry of Research, uh, Innovation, and Digitalization, uh, legislative proposals that will help the implementation of EDF regulation national level. In this period, after the launching of the um, uh, programs, we had uh, a lot of uh, discussion at uh, uh, the experts level, also at the um, 
Secretary of State level, uh, we harmonized our opinions and also we harmonized the opinion, sh opinion within, at least with the Ministry of, of uh, National Defense, within our ministry. So we sent the proposals for um, um, ordinance, uh, urgent ordinance of government to the Ministry of Research, which will promote this ordinance. I, we will hope that the promotion of this legislative initiative will start um, next weeks and uh, it will be approved as soon as possible in order to uh, implement, to, as we said, the EDF regulation, uh, including the, um, uh, the touchy problem of uh, uh, co-financing. After the, um, um, this uh, government ordinance will be approved in 30 days, we want to issue a, a common order, ministerial order, of the three ministry, ministers uh, to approve the procedure as such. Um, also, we established our priorities in approaching EDF projects. Our, when I speak about our uh, priorities, I speak about the Ministry of Defense priorities and uh, priorities, prioritization was given by the defense staff, which is uh, um, the organisms which <coughs> dictate our line of innovation to the Ministry of Defense because they are uh, those who are uh, mastering the requirements, namely the operational requirements. Um, of course, our first priority is con connected to categories of projects concerning passive and active sensors, cyber, future air combat and ground combat technologies, especially the unmanned ones, as well as other disruptive technology progress, prog projects. Sorry. We know that we still have a lot of work in supporting the Romanian entities participating in the ADF. We want to see the Romanian companies or academia involved in many projects, and we strongly encourage the Romanian leadership, at least of one consortia, one consortium, sorry. Um, this would be connected to EDF, but on the other hand, I want to stress out that uh, we develop our own tools, plans, budgets, and our R&D structures uh, to develop uh, important projects, including uh, in cooperation with industry, um, which, are, which are budgeted by us. And I'm referring here to the Military Research and Development Sectorian Plan um, in order to successfully approach those teams which are very important for uh, us and which will help the development of the Romanian Armed Forces in the 21st centuries. Therefore, for us, all the entities working in the national territory are equally important. Uh, State-owned companies, private companies, sort of the representative of, of important foreign companies here in Romania, as well as, as the research institutes and uh, universities. Actually, we, sent, uh, we had had a lot of discussions with universities. And as my friend George is looking for his uh, watch, I believe I passed the eight minutes. So thank you very much for uh, uh, the op this opportunity. I hope that I answered two questions also. <laughs> thank you. <coughs> thank you, General. Your presentation was very interesting. And more interesting to, uh, in uh, your presentation is the fact that you mentioned uh, your initiative about uh, uh, linked in uh, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Research, and Ministry of Industry. Is I want to congratulate to that for, for that, and uh, because uh, in my former activity from the, in the military research uh, activities, uh, it's very good. I am very happy to to hear that. Thank you very much. So next uh, next speaker is Via VTC. Is the uh, Dr. Gustav. Windroot, it's okay. We can see you. Yes, that's okay. I can see you. Thank you. Hmm? It's okay, sir. 
Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? I hear you. You hear us? Yeah. Yes, I hear you very well. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I see you. Uh, thank you for, present, uh, for your presence in uh, our panel. Mr. Gustav went to work in the European Co Commission as a policy officer for defense research at the Directorate General for Defense Industry and Space. He is a part of the team implemented the European Defense Fund, EDF, uh, as uh, well as the pilot calls uh, under preparatory action on defense uh, research and the uh, European Defense Industrial Development Program. He has uh, previously worked uh, in the Directorate General for Research and in Innovation, working the, on a research program uh, under uh, the uh, seventh uh, framework program, Horizon 2020, and a new uh, Horizon Europe uh, framework uh, program. So he has a good experience in the field of uh, research, uh, and in particular of research for the defense. Uh, so, sir, please, your, uh, you are the floor. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much for the introduction. I also would like to thank uh, the uh, Major General for the very good introduction also to the European Defence Fund. Uh, that also makes my presentation a bit uh, shorter, um, because uh, there was already some um, information being given there. I'm, I had a couple of slides. I think that would help uh, also uh, just uh, what I'm uh, saying. These uh, slides can also be shared after the event. Um, I'm not sure I cannot see those slides at the moment. Yes, there we go. So uh, I'm going to just uh, very briefly also build on what uh, the Major General had said uh, in the beginning on what the European Defence Fund is, where it comes from, and what is the actual, uh, the current state and what we're looking at today for 2021 and in the immediate uh, future. So next, uh, next slide, please. So uh, really where we come from is that the, uh, the defense industry in Europe is really linked to a lot of uh, direct jobs of um, the, um, on the manufacturing side, but also the whole value chain uh, within the defense industry. It has a really large uh, turnover uh, within uh, the European market, and also it, it's linked to quite substantial um, exports. So next slide, please. Um, the uh, European defense industry is, uh, again, not only supporting uh, security and um, uh, defense, but it also has this economic dimension. So it's this, uh, let's say, three, three links uh, that we're looking at for the defense industry. And that also what makes it interesting uh, uh, as a European entity. Uh, there, there's a strong role of the governments that also has already been uh, said before in this uh, session with a link to the ministries of defense. Um, the, also, what we see is the technology has a good spillover to other sectors, to civilian sectors, to other type of sectors where we can build on uh, the learning of what we have from the defense. Um, we have, uh, of course, large companies involved, but also very a lot of SMEs. The Major General was uh, uh, mentioning that the, also the European Defence Fund is focusing our, uh, a lot of efforts onto the SMEs and mid-caps, where we also want to uh, support their involvement. And again, it's very R&D intensive. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on the um, uh, R&D side, a, a large percentage of all the technologies that we have for the defense industry, for the defense applications, are linked to R&D. So we have, for instance, up to 30% of combat aircraft, 60% of uh, navigation surveillance satellites. That's a whole uh, different part where it's very intensive uh, in terms of development. And uh, again, then the, um, uh, the uh, deployment of such uh, such technologies then has a smaller part, but also for missiles and for uh, unmanned uh, vehicles, air, uh, aircrafts, and so on, it's a large uh, um, it's a large part where, where uh, R&D is involved. Um, also, the development costs. So that's uh, the second part of the European Defence Fund that I will come back to. Uh, the development cost is also very large, and that normally 
uh, exceeds, uh, let's say, the capability of a single member state. And that is also uh, one of the reasons where there's a justification to go together and put something together. So, for instance, for the Eurofighter, where several member states are involved, um, that development cost of that type of uh, system is, is quite large in the order of 20 billion. Next slide, please. So um, that comes to the European Defence Fund. I want to mention in this aspect as well that we have a global strategy for uh, the European Union's foreign and security policy from 2016 that builds on that and mentions uh, the need for a collaborative, um, uh, uh, um, collaborative research um, strategies also for defence. Um, so that builds up then the objectives. Uh, this has already been mentioned in this session, um, but I want to mention it again. It's really about strategic autonomy. It's about competitiveness of the European industry supporting these uh, defense technologies. It's about um, uh, really focusing on research and development projects, collaborative uh, research and development projects for disruptive uh, technologies. It's to help the uh, technological gap from emerging technologies towards then uh, development and deployment of these technologies. So there is uh, what we call also the valley of death between basic research and uh, towards prototyping and uh, further development. That type of uh, gap is what we would like to, uh, to uh, uh, let's say, close with this European Defence Fund. And this is very much in similar what we do, do on the civilian side for industrially linked partnerships where we have uh, research building on on towards uh, then development and prototyping and commercialization of technologies. And in the end, it will support and um, uh, build towards strengthening the security of Europe and strengthen uh, as well the joint acquisition of uh, then uh, uh, technologies. So that is one of the goals and one of the outcomes that we would like to see from the um, European Defence Fund. Next slide, please. Um, so we don't uh, just deploy the uh, European Defence Fund directly. We've had, as uh, many of you already are aware, we've had um, other uh, programmes uh, building up to this. So pilot uh, calls from PADR and EDIDP. I will come uh, just mention them a bit more uh, further on. And also Major General had uh, mentioned the PESCO project as well. Of course, that fills a very important role in how we, uh, the landscape as we're uh, then uh, looking into for the European Defence Fund. So European Defence Fund is uh, today uh, for 2021, it will uh, start and that is what we will launch. But I will just mention PADR and EDIDP on the next slide, please. Um, so um, the preparatory action for defence research um, that we have, uh, we've had three calls from 2017 to 2019, much smaller uh, calls looking into what type of um, research projects, collaborative research projects we, we are able to, to run. And that would also, of course, shape the research calls also for a, a European Defence Fund. It's a 90 million uh, euro in total. Uh, for the EDIDP, next slide, please. Um, then we have two years. We had uh, both last year and the year before that, we have two call years, 500 million, but then focusing on the development, so industrial development program for European defence. And that was really to foster then uh, the other part of the European Defence Fund, the competitiveness and the uh, then bringing, bringing the technologies up, the technology readiness levels to be able to, to then deploy them in the industry and to build up both IP and know-how in uh, the European defence sector. Next slide, please. Um, um, so that brings us into a uh, European Defence Fund. It's about 8 billion euros over uh, then the next uh, funding, uh, funding period, which is uh, from this year, 2021, to 2027. So that means that we will launch calls annually all these years. And that uh, also will um, uh, allow uh, for a continuity and also for uh, the industry to plan a bit ahead, knowing that uh, these funding opportunities come uh, on a good, a good span of years as well. 
And it's both uh, researchers, as I mentioned, so there's um, funding earmarked for then more um, exploratory research projects, as well as um, uh, capability development. So development, development and to, be, to develop that type of capabilities. The research, of course, is more funded with a higher uh, percentage. Uh, and then as we go along, we, we uh, go closer and closer towards the acquisition, which is then in the responsibility for the member states. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the timeline here for the 2021 calls, we had an event, a launch event for the European Defence Fund on the 30th of June. We plan to uh, open the calls uh, for submission. You can already find the details for these calls uh, online. I have the link there below. Um, but we plan to open them for submission from, uh, from September uh, onwards, and we will close it in early December. That's the plan. And then we will do evaluation, and then we will be able to uh, start the project's end of next year. So that's more or less uh, the, uh, the plan. I also would like to mention, and I don't have that on my slides, is that uh, on the 15th of September, we have an info day for uh, proposers. And the, the days coming after the 15th of September, so the 16th and 17th, there will be events and brokerage events where you can also partner, partner up with other um, uh, proposers to see if you can join uh, proposals there as well. So I would really like to uh, encourage you to uh, register the, to that event. The registration is still open until the 8th of September. Um, I will. Uh, I can also share the link uh, afterwards, but you can, if you search for uh, the uh, European Defence Fund Info Days, uh, you will you will be able to find it on the Commission websites. Um, the Major General also mentioned another point uh, is the national focal points. Uh, it's it's a network of uh, uh, let's say people who are very well uh, informed of the call topics and how the European Defence Fund work. Um, that group is being built up as we speak, and uh, in the coming days they will have their first meeting. And after that, we will be able to give you more information of how these, uh, how to contact these na national focal points. So just at this at, uh, today, we don't have that uh, information published, but that will come in the coming days. And then, so please, uh, please have a look out for these national focal points as well. And in, especially on the uh, 15th of September on our info day, we will have all the details on how to contact these national, national focal points as well. So I think that uh, just in the ne next slide, if I still have uh, two seconds, I would just like to mention what type uh, of calls we have for 2021. It's um, 1.2 billion uh, euros in total uh, that we would like to have spread over 23 different calls. Uh, I will not mention them uh, here, uh, all of them, but you can see them on the slide. They really, they really uh, cover a vast range of different applications. On top of this, we have um, uh, open calls for um, uh, new technologies, innovative defense technologies, as well as specific calls for SMEs. So if you're an SME, uh, it's also a very good opportunity to join um, uh, and have a look at these, uh, this range of calls and also have a look at the particular uh, call that is dedicated to SMEs. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. Also, I would like to thank the organizers for a very good, uh, very good organization. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Uh, and uh, thank you again uh, for uh, <coughs> Be, uh, because you mentioned us again uh, what is a way to to follow uh, uh, to be present uh, in the European Defence Fund and uh, I think it's very important uh, uh, to to show us what is means uh, the cycle of, of uh, entire activities uh, for research and developments and uh, finally the link uh, with these activities uh, with uh, capabilities um, uh, products. So thank you again, sir. Uh, the next uh, speaker uh, with our panel is uh, Mr. Uh, Cyril Brett, it's okay. It's a professor of the School of Public, uh, Public, uh, Public Affairs, Science uh, in Paris. 
Mr. Sarir Brett is a senior auditor of the French General uh, Inspection for Administration, uh, laureate of National School for Social Sci Science in the Paris Institute of Political Science. He is uh, graduated from uh, the National School of Government uh, and the National Institute for Strategic uh, stud uh, Studies. Uh, Chief of, staff, uh, of staff, uh, staff, sorry, to the French ambassador of the or ambassador to the organize uh, for security and cooperation in uh, Europe, uh, and the charge of Central Asia in uh, 2009. He is currently co coordination development director at Naval Group. So, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for uh, having me on that panel with distinguished guests. I would like uh, uh, to say that uh, I'm honored to be here and very glad to meet our Romanian friends. I think that the Black Sea and Balkan Security Forum is a, is a platform of vital importance, especially for us, the French, in order to grasp what are the challenges in the Black Sea and the, the region. I know that uh, our diplomatic network here is very active, but for us, for the industry sector, for the civil society, it's a unique platform uh, that allows us to understand what is at stake here in Romania and more generally speaking in the region. Now to the topic of our discussions today. What can I, s what can I say? You, General, you told us almost everything on innovation in the defense sector here in Romania, and the colleague of the uh, European Commission has already uh, outlined the uh, landscape of the uh, next uh, steps. What can I? What can I say? I can. I, I won't make any advertisement. Everyone see uh, the. Uh, huge advertisement on our Corvette, uh, on, the, the on Naval Group. What, can, what, what I would like to, to share with you is it's our experience as an industry state-owned company uh, on innovation. And the, uh, the situation of uh, such a company uh, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to uh, innovation in the European framework is of course an asset, innovation is already an asset for us. It's been an asset in many competitions in Europe and uh, across the world, but it's also a, a set of challenges because when you're faced with the imperative of making innovations, you are faced with new challenges. I'll come to that and it will be of uh, importance for us for the months, the weeks, to come here in Romania, of course, in Europe, and probably elsewhere as well. It's an asset because innovation is at the core of uh, our company uh, activity. Uh, war, warfare, and uh, strategic relations have long been a question of technology, of uh, technological superiority at sea, at land, on the shore, uh, what makes you stronger or what, what can make you stronger than the enemy is technology, of course, and it's particularly the case in the naval sector. Detection, uh, unmanned vehicles, uh, cyber warfare are already a part of our programs, of our innovation programs, and that's those are the domains in which we are proposing to our customers, national and uh, foreign uh, customers' uh, solutions. It's been, a, it's been an asset, and I will take an example outside of Europe. Uh, it's been an asset for the competition for the uh, Australian attack submarines. Uh, we propose not only technological innovations, but as well industrial and political uh, innovation. Technological, I, I won't go into uh, details. I'm I have not the skills to, to do that, but we propose a, a brand new submarine in order to meet the constraints and the needs of uh, Australia. Australia is faced with a major 
strategic challenge. It, it's well, yes, it's probably the, the most significant strategic st challenge of the country since uh, the uh, end of uh, Cold War, and we proposed it with a new set of technologies, of course, but also with a new kind of cooperation in, in Australia. And at that point of my presentation, I want to emphasize the fa fact that innovation is not only a question of technology, it's also a question of organization and a question of dialogue. If you want to have real innovation, you have to open up to your partners, to listen to them. You have to understand what is needed from the technical, technological point of view, from the military point of view, the diplomatic point of view, and from the point of view of the uh, society. You cannot root innovation within your program without listening to your partners and what they need. And what, needed, what was needed by Australia was not only submarines, but it was the construction or the rebuilding of the defense sector, generally speaking, even from the social point of view. So it's an asset for us, and it's something very important. I won't go through the uh, 40 patents we have uh, per year. I won't go through the uh, programs we already launched with uh, EDIDP, even though uh, I'm proud to say that uh, uh, Romanian companies are involved in one of them, mine hunting. But uh, for us, it's an asset. It's an asset in the competition uh, against our favorite uh, rivals everywhere in the world. It's an asset in the dialogue with other uh, companies in order to make sure that the, the partnerships are well done. And I have my shareholder here, Thales Group, and I'm happy to say that uh, it's impossible for us, uh, Naval Group, to uh, innovate in the long run without the support, not only the financial and the technological support, but with the governance support of our uh, shareholder and without the, uh, the yes, the incentive to uh, innovate. But I must say that, and that's probably the second part and the most important part of uh, my presentation, I must say that innovation uh, from a technological, from a political, from an economic, from a financial point of view is also a major challenge for a state-owned company focused on the French uh, Navy, as it is, is it's been the case for nav Naval Group. And innovation as a transformative force for our uh, company. It, it forces us to uh, listen to the partners. It, it forces us to uh, understand what division of work we can do. It forces us to listen to the uh, European authorities in order, for example, we will uh, participate in the next calls for the EDF, that's Needs, needless uh, to, to say, of course, but it will force us to understand the logic that our European partners have, the logic of what is at stake in the very progressive construction of a European uh, defense. And I'm quite sure that all the difficulties we will face in, in grappling with those calls will force us to improve the way we innovate, of course, on the domain of naval combat, where it was one of the major domains of innovation we are, faces, we, are, we are facing. But I am quite sure that Naval Group will strengthen its already uh, booming uh, innovation uh, sector thanks to uh, that uh, EDF. I will add, because I have a new capacity now, uh, I'm based in Greece and I represent the uh, the group, the company uh, in, uh, in Athens, it's, it's a big honor. I must say that the innovation is not, not only uh, tec technological, uh, social, political, I already said that, but it's also a question of mindset. If you want to be a force of proposition, you have to understand what is at stake with the uh, innovation required by your client. From an engineer point of view, you would say that innovation is, not, is only a question of performance. You have to be better than the competitors. You have to be better than you have been in the past. You have to be better 
than uh, the uh, potential enemy of your customer. But it, it's also a question of mindset. It's a also a question of adaptability uh, in the dialogue you have with the, uh, with the authorities. If you keep on stumbling on the same difficulties, if you go on uh, repeating the same offers again and again without finding solutions, you are not in a mindset of innovation. You are not in the mindset of listening to what is needed and what is most important, innovation has to take it into account constraints, fiscal budget constraints of your, uh, of your customer, of your prospect, and it leads us to a new development of innovation for Naval Group, which is sober innovation. It's no low cost or low quality innovation, but it's sober innovation. You can make the, you have to make the most of it uh, with a limited and defined amount of, uh, of uh, money. So once again, and this, this will be the, the last word, uh, you know, the last element I will share with you, uh, of course, first and foremost, uh, Naval Group and probably most of the uh, defense industry companies are dedicated to technological excellence and constant innovation. But we cannot limit ourselves to that. We have to broaden the scope of our uh, innovation initiatives. And I'm quite confident that the dialogue with our customers in Europe and the dialogue with the uh, European authorities, thanks to the EDF, uh, will allow us to uh, tackle that challenge for the decade to, to come here in Romania, in Europe, and probably elsewhere, especially in Asia and in the Middle East. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, Thank you, because you mentioned uh, what this means, innovation in the technological process. Uh, you mentioned that because uh, you are uh, a business. You are in a business, and uh, innovation is means business. I am sure behind your uh, innovation activities is a very high and very good uh, research and development activities. So thank you for that. Next uh, speaker uh, is Mr. Christian Sviki, manager for Defense Thales Romania. Uh, Mr. S uh, Christian Sviki is a graduate uh, in uh, nuclear physics and uh, master science for uh, Royal Defense Academy and, uh, and uh, Cranfield University in the international defense sales uh, and uh, marketing. Mr. Christian uh, has uh, been uh, in the aerospace, defense, and security industry for uh, 25 years, starting as a junior marketing officer uh, as a local, a local radio, now Thales, in Romania. Um, so, Christy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, good morning, everybody. It is always difficult to speak after such a distinguished panel because all the brilliant ideas have already been consumed by your uh, predecessor speakers. So I will try to give you a flavor uh, from uh, a man who has spent um, most of his uh, active career in the Romanian defense industry. Uh, in the next uh, couple of uh, minutes, um, I will have the, the privilege to talk about a topic that, as my, uh, my panel colleagues have said, as of June 2021, has become an opportunity for the European defense establishment, both industrial but also military. Uh, and obviously I'm talking about the European Defense Fund. I will try to present a Thales Group perspective on NDF, However, you must be aware that um, uh, as Thales Group, we have a significant presence footprint in Romania, given by, uh, by our uh, engineering competence center. Um, and uh, for those who are not aware, I took the liberty uh, to um, 
uh, put uh, on, on the slide uh, just behind me a uh, couple of details. Obviously, we are over 700 employees in Romania. Um, Thales Romania being a member of the national defense industry, uh, we can call ourselves, we call ourselves a small SME, registered uh, with the Ministry of uh, Economy, uh, approved to work on classified programs for all the um, defense and security establishment and qualified by the Romanian Export Control Authorities. So these are just to set the scene. I'm not going to get into too many details about what we are doing in Romania. I don't want to be a sales pitch, but I just want to tell you that I'm very proud that 700 uh, of Romanian engineers work for a, uh, a company that has its in, in its DNA the innovation, the cooperation, um, and, and all the, um, the fundamental principles that uh, um, are at the basis of the European Union and more specifically at the European Defence Fund. Because at the end of the day, what we are talking, uh, and um, as far as I know, I, uh, I know uh, this is the first time when Europe has got together and start spending significant amounts of money on defense. So I think we all should be proud of it because we are Romanian, uh, we are Romanian, so we are a member of the Uni European Union. The big question remains how us Romanian and Romanian companies, and by here I'm talking all the SMEs and all my friends in the small and medium Romanian enterprises here uh, present in, uh, in the whole um, how can we benefit of this opportunity given, given to us? Um, I'm going to try and move on to the next slide. So this is, um, this is uh, the, our group. Uh, we work as a one team of TALIS. We cover basically defense, space, security, aerospace and ground transportation. Um, I'm very, very, very proud of my colleagues. I'm not going to get into details, but just let me tell you that uh, talking about involving the academia in 2021, uh, and every year actually, we have an internship program, we have an agreement with the Romanian, uh, with the Polytechnic uh, uh, University of Bucharest, and uh, as an example, this year, we took on board 80 students for a period of three months, most of them at the end of this period uh, will probably remain with us uh, and continue or, or begin their, uh, their career in either defense or space or security. Uh, oops, sorry. Now, as I've said, I'm going to repeat myself, but what can I do? Uh, I'm, I'm, I, um, I will try and be uh, not, to, not to be that repeat repetitive. Um, while, uh, while smaller than Horizon uh, Europe uh, program which is dedicated to uh, the civilian R&D program, um, the EDF, uh, as, as my predecessor says, covers 7.9 billion. Uh, what uh, what uh, it worth highlighting is that 380 million per year are dedicated to EU funding and these are 100% eligible for, uh, for funding, whilst approximately 760 million per year are eligible for development activities. Uh, obviously, the EDF development activities would require uh, a certain level of co-funding, and I believe that we're talking here also of the presence of three member states and a and, and couple of ideas that I'm going to, to mention a bit uh, later. Um, Primarily, we all, we all have to, be to admit that the lack of cross-border co collaboration in the defense supply chain have fragmented the defense R&D and have led to the deterioration of the competitiveness of European defense industry, mainly because it was not subject of EU common market rules. Consequ consequently, Today, most of the European armed forces, and Romania is included, use different equipment, a major issue to the development of military mobility. Furthermore, it constrains the possibility of economies of scale 
if procurement and maintenance costs are not shared. So, in our opinion, EDF offers us a unique opportunity to, uh, to engage in, 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 this, uh, in this project. And, and again, I'm, I'm, repeating, uh, uh, I'm repeating Mr. Winroth, but I just wanted to tell you where we are. Um, so today we are in the proposal writing uh, um, phase, uh, which will end in December. Um, following that, I'm not going to get into, into uh, the rest of the details, but you can see it for yourself. We're talking EDF 2021. The work program has been already approved, but there is also an EDF 2022. So I think that what I'd like to highlight in, in, in my speech is that I believe that EDF 2021 has somehow, uh, mm, we have a certain delay in Romania in terms of embracing the projects from the EDF 2021. However, uh, my speech will end with a food for thought and with the fact that there is hope. Um, not gonna, not gonna repeat, but just to tell you that the 2021 has identified the 15 categories that are funded. In this, f in these categories, 23 calls have been identified and 37 topics. So, from 2021 EDF fund, 310 millions are for research, 620 millions are for, um, for development, and there is an appropriation just to launch this program by the European Commission of, of 290 million euros. So there is a lot of money for those of us who have been in the Romanian defense industry for 25 years, this seems to be the, the opportunity of a lifetime. In the left there, you see all the unchanging categories. So every year, these categories will repeat itself. So what I'd like to invite my colleagues uh, and our customer to, to, to open the dialogue uh, uh, on any of each of the categories. And obviously, I have retained from the general that enhanced mobility, artificial intelligence, cyber, and CUAS are, uh, are um, topics of importance. So why you believe that uh, EDF is important for Romania? Well, obviously, uh, we know that uh, there is the 2% of GDP uh, political agreement. Now, think about if we use part of the, the funding uh, from, uh, from the, defense, the national defense budget and we combine that with EDF. Think about the multiplication factor, both for the customer and also for the industry. Uh, basically, with uh, 1.15 billion euros per year on research and technology, I think it is important to have the Romanian uh, industry involved. Obviously, the landscape will change. Uh, the European Defence Industrial and Technology Base will change. So every year, we have an opportunity to improve ourselves, to join new programmes uh, or, or, or uh, to, to open new, uh, new uh, topics of dialogue. With Thales presence in Romania, um, I think that the customers, our customers, but also the industry could, could benefit from, uh, from, our, from the experience of our uh, 700, uh, at the end of the year being 800 uh, engineers, so you can benefit of our technological f footprint, but also we can put you in touch with the other European countries. The, we, are, we have a network through Thales uh, that can help. If we don't have the knowledge, other of our colleagues will have. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna dwell it too much into into uh, our strategy, our approach. Um, you have it on the slide. Uh, we are about to finalize the consortia to build and submit the offers. Uh, we are preparing now our thoughts and ideas for 2022 and beyond. And uh, obviously, uh, we, we have the uh, talks with, uh, with our business, uh, business lines uh, and our partners. Um, I must say that uh, to, to my, um, to my um, um, insatisfaction, I cannot highlight a project from the 20 2021 programs where Thales is involved and you have them on this uh, on this slide and where a Romanian entity 
is also involved. We did not manage, and this is a failure on, on our behalf as Thales Romania, to, uh, to identify a program that uh, would satisfy not only the Romanian customer, but would also bring uh, together technologies and capabilities from, from it. Uh, last but not least, uh, it's it's small script, but just to say, say that uh, there is still hope. If we're missing this boat, uh, there is another one every year till 2027 and beyond uh, with projects, with programs, with technology, with innovation. And uh, we as Thales, we are here to serve our customer, but also we're here to look for partnerships. So feel free to, to engage myself and the rest of our 800 colleagues uh, to find ways of cooperating to the benefit of Romania and European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christi. <coughs> Christian. Um, very good and a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, a lot of answer of uh, your about uh, the, your question uh, during the presentation. I think uh, we will find uh, in the procedure who general mentioned uh, who is now in the work uh, uh, this procedure linked to the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Research and Ministry of Industry. Thank you. Uh, and the next uh, and the last um, spe speaker is uh, Mr. Naya Catalin, my boss now. I am R&D director uh, in the INCAS. Mr. Nae is president uh, and general director of uh, to the National Institute of Aerospace Research, Ilya Karafoli, INCAS. Mr. Nae Catalin is a uh, president of uh, he has the president of the European Research Esta Establishment in Aeronautics. Aeronautics Association area between uh, 2018 to 2019, president of uh, the Supersonic Tunnel Association International STI between uh, 2017 to 2019, and former vi vice president uh, of gover governing board of uh, EU GAT Clean Sky. Mr. Nye, please, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much for enabling this type of presentation that I'm somehow trying to adapt a little bit, uh, take into account things that have been already said, and on the other hand, trying to um, stay in the time that has been allocated. So in my intention would be just to have a single commercial presentation with respect to what INGAS is, just to compete a little bit with Thales. Uh, so we are a Romanian public body. Uh, we have some significant uh, history behind. So for those of you who are informed, we are the continuator of the INCREST. So it's more than 70 years of R&T that we did in Romania. On the other hand, uh, of course, we are uh, in this business for uh, aeronautics and space. And most certainly, uh, we have preserved most of the assets that we had before 1990. Before 1990, just to have an information, Inca size was around 3,500 employees. We're still operating with a lot of people, a lot of people. Uh, but still, uh, we preserve some of the assets. So basically, we are the only DOA in aeronautics around here, uh, which is quite a significant achievement. And on the other hand, we operate probably the largest infrastructure for aeronautics existing in this area of Europe. So we operate wind tunnels, uh, structural testing, harsh environmental testing facilities, and so on, which is a real asset for all air and space uh, new development, so to speak. Uh, and we definitely promote this capability at European level, and we are recognized as such. Now, when it comes to currently the way to do business, of course, Excellence Center this is part of our group. We operate three such Excellence Center that we are very proud of. One of them is linked to um, Earth monitoring, so to speak, and uh, looking on this more meteorological flight test beds. And uh, the other two are more dedicated, one on launchers, basically on ESA technologies. And last but not least, probably the most significant 
technological investment in this area on new technologies for aeronautics based on the, let's say, Green Deal constraints uh, that will be operational next year in Krajowa. Now, coming to the topic of the discussion today, you research for defense. There are many things to be said here. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm just trying to complement a little bit things that have been said by just putting forward that uh, this is a very complex context. We are talking on mainly international cooperation framework. There are strategic partnerships that have not been born yesterday. New partnerships are always possible, but uh, okay, you have to take care of that. Then there is a national policy all the time behind, and it is not easy for an entity to control that process, by the way. We would like to be in the loop, but obviously we have no means to interfere to that one, mainly when it comes to commitments, international commitments, or national legal framework. What we heard from Major General today, it's very positive, so things are changing. We hope that the changes that are to be provided with respect to the way to perform research for defense go in line with our expectations. So that's why I, I uh, beg to be at least informed on the topic and for the discussions to follow. Last but not least, human and uh, citizen dimension, so to speak. We all the time come from a more civil environment, so most certainly most of the research we perform all the time puts us a certain uh, flavor on this idea of being human or citizen-centric schemes, not always in line with the defense policy. Now, some conclusions. After 70 years of European funding in projects, which by the way represent a significant share of our income that I will show you later, uh, we can say a few words about topics that have been uh, already mentioned today, like PESCO, the IDP, or uh, what will follow as the EDF. First of all, this is not a classical research and innovation framework. So most certainly if we try to associate, and now I'm speaking on behalf of the civil society more or less, this type of defense research, it is not at all the type of classical research and innovation framework as it is currently promoted either in to the end of Horizon 2020 or to Horizon Europe to follow. It's a very special framework, believe me. And then when it comes to industrial partnerships or joint ventures or PPPs, whatever form of partnership will be in defense projects are totally different compared to those that are part of the Rise in Europe projects. And why I'm saying that? Because at national level we have incentive schemes in order to support international partnerships, but obviously this is not at all appropriate for what will follow. So we definitely need to define what is an industrial r and partnership when it comes to research for defense. Now, the more we go to the open, full, transparent, free access, uh, this is totally different. Huh? So, so most of the people should imagine that those are the key ingredients inside in order to get funded out of public funding at national level. So we all have probably to work together in order, first of all, to understand what are the new words, and then, of course, to harmonize our legal uh, entities to that part. Now, assuming that people still consider dissemination or uh, public instruments available, uh, that's even more complex than that. So in the end, what a European research for defense is, most certainly it's a reality. It's already presented as a success story. And most certainly, even as we take big companies, like the ones that have uh, advocated here, they should most certainly will show you what is a true success in this part of the program. On the other hand, it's a true opportunity, but only if you are inside the club. What is this club? Well, we are learning. We don't know exactly who are the members of the club, but yes, it's a club. We hope it's not a close club. We hope it will be still possible to join the club. It's on us to do the work, but most certainly, this is not at all open. Now, a strategic partnership for research and innovation, mainly involving industrial uh, aspects, you have to be supported by your member state. You cannot be in a member state, in European Union, have your own strategy at company level, 
and not being part of the strategy of the member state with respect to developing your own capabilities, assets, and so on. So in that context, obviously, you can use it as a strategic partnership, but still you have to have some substance behind. And last, and I would say not least, yes, most certainly, this is a secure long-term investment in technologies, in high-tech technologies. But again, only if you have the appropriate support for your country. Now, of course, uh, why we'd like that? Because as a company, I have to admit, we definitely are very fond and keen to be part of the European defense framework. Uh, one thing is on the way it is structured. We are already used to what is currently available in Europe, like strategic research and innovation. And the more you go to the aeronautics, you will see that dual-use technologies are there, and most certainly the major industrial players are there. This is obviously the case for Thales, just to refer to a specific company. They are part of the people or the stakeholders defining those strategic research agendas. However, the more we go to defense, we have a new stakeholder on the table. And this is the way how the definition of the work programs in defense are built. They are no longer built on the same premises. And then we have the member states involved and more certainly the need to communicate to the member states on defense topics. This is totally different since they have some kind of a similarity to the public research agenda at European level, but most certainly it's highly dependent on the specificity of the defense programs. And to conclude, we spend significant effort to convince national stakeholders and to promote a real strategy on how to do things. Of course, we are talking on a bottom-up approach. We are not talking on a top-down approach. This is why we try to be present in meetings like this one to tell you that, yes, there are stakeholders in Romania eager to be part of the European defense framework, and they, they have some something to say. Now, what can we offer and what everybody should consider? We have testing infrastructures, by the way. So we are talking on an R&D programs, testing infrastructures or research development infrastructures. It's the key ingredient for all this process. We are the ones preserving high technological capabilities in our testing infrastructures. And most important, we have capabilities for VNV and certification. This is, part, this is a critical phase the more you go to the commercial world. So most of the company involved in this type of developments, they definitely have to sync on VMV and certification. And the more we go into this process, yes, we have things that we can offer, could be an asset for us, but yes, we need a strategy and a specific policy behind. And of course, synergies with other relevant military acquisition programs. Let's not forget that the world is not only on funding for the research. It's a very complex, it's a round sphere, more or less, where everybody takes benefit of whatever different type of other acquisition is involved. I'm not talking specific offsets or something equivalent, but there are many things behind this phrase. Now, as an R&D company, we have 40% of our income in 2020 coming from this type of European public partnerships at European level. Now, if we look carefully inside, with respect to the defense projects, we are growing, but we are still low, 5%. But when it comes to the national defense activities, this is very low, so we don't want yet to talk about that. So now the question is, can you live by these numbers? Would that be more appropriate to go vice versa? So that would be food for thought, as Stale said. Now, Europeans in the European Defense Program, we consider this was the most um, delicate subject because we can talk only about missing, missed opportunities, not on a great achievements. Money was there, capabilities were present, but we were not able to exploit them. Of course, we have some significant results. We still can claim on that, but most certainly by all the standards, we are far below the threshold. Now, we did something as a company, as it is the case of EREA, which stands for European Research Establishment Association, Defense Research Group, which is our presence in Brussels, more or less, in order to make us aware of the developments in this sector as well. 
Of course, having a, a higher presence in Brussels is one of these things that we all the time promoted, and we are desperate to continue that. And then, of course, we look on the next calls as opportunities to build. This is work in progress, as Thales mentioned, and I will try to show you something on that as well, with a little bit of pictures, just to, to apologize for being between you and the next session. Now, this is a little bit linked to the other things, and I'm just trying to show you real projects, real projects, real proposals to be part of the process. I, I had some permissions for, for all those people which are involved as partners. So what you have here is the continuation of the trainer program in Romania to Janus. Janus is answering the EDA Red Air PMC for 2021, which is a very interesting topic, mainly with respect to why it's needed in Europe, because it's missing, and how to do it, and obviously uh, to think um, on all the implications. By the way, you have to imagine that uh, in Romania there were a lot of examples of R&T that eventually went into the usage of the Minister of Defense. The only one which is still in service in the aviation sector is not something performed together with the Minister of Defense. It was an R&T program, and this is the Romanian trainer. So this is the real value of R&T. Yeah? Now, second point, racer. RACER is even more interesting than the Janus project as presented. It's a continuation of the fast rotorcraft in Clean Sky 2. Now there is an international partnership and the need in order to consider this as a European asset for the future. By the way, we just delivered together with Romairo the main airframe, which is in the assembly line now, as we call it. Original airborne sensing and operational center, just to make usage of something coming from partners like Thales in Romania. We are about to be the only regional center doing that in civil airspace and flying under youth space regulations as well, promoting our capabilities. And another thing which probably was of interest very uh, for, for a lot of people is moving a little bit to conversion of a military aircraft, which is a Spartan transport aircraft, to a firefighting European force, which, by the way, is still part of a project that has not been yet evaluated. So again, these are examples of real projects, real partnerships with a lot of money, because obviously money is important. Our way forward. Okay, Sir. we have a way forward, but just to say something. Last, most important. This it is not on the Ministry of Defense, it's on the Ministry of Economy, in our opinion, that we have to fight for. So the Ministry of Economy, in our opinion, is where the money is, is where the beneficiary is, so most certainly we have to join forces, not only in the Ministry of Defense, but mainly with the Ministry of Economy or whatever the name of this ministry at Romanian level. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, about the clubs, I think the clubs is open, depend of us what we open the door. So I'm sorry. But uh, I think the question about this uh, this panel we can put uh, uh, during during the the break. I'm sorry for that. I think it was a very good presentation, and I thank uh, thank uh, thanks for uh, the speaker and thanks for the new strategy center to have uh, to uh, uh, for uh, this opportunity to present our uh, uh, our uh, activities. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.